to me, it's simply, I'll, I'll give a, you know, a very simple answer, which is they've been climbing a ladder that's been leaning against the wrong building, right? So it's this, it's this idea that we start chasing things that we are either told or we start to believe are the thing that we should chase. And then when we finally catch that thing, we recognize it's not the thing, right? It's, it somehow feels empty. We thought it was going to feel great. And yet, it doesn't. And I, I take that back and go, well, why is that? And to me, it was that we didn't do a, an, an effective job or we didn't do any job of really asking ourselves, what have I been built to chase? Like, what is my divine purpose? Do you know your purpose in life? Simon Sinek tells us to start with why. Winston Churchill said that living isn't enough if you aren't determined to live or something. Buddha teaches that your purpose in life is to find your purpose. And there's an endless list of scholars and leaders who have written or spoken about their thoughts on this topic, from Brene Brown to Richard Feynman, from Nietzsche to Martin Luther King Jr. For some, it's a divine calling. For many, it's tied closely to their beliefs and the reason that their creator or their God put them on this earth, which is certainly the case for my guests today, as we will hear shortly. And for others, it's simply about finding that intersection of what they're good at, what they enjoy, and what they can have the most impact by doing, which is probably the category I would put myself in. But whatever the underlying logic and beliefs behind it, it can be a truly transformational moment in your life and your career once you reach that point of realisation knowing your purpose, living and leading authentically according to that purpose, mission or vision. Again, the name you give it is less important than simply knowing what it is. My guest today is Eric Sardina. He is an executive coach who helps his clients find meaning, purpose, success and overwhelming joy in their lives. He also hosts a podcast called Return to Authenticity where his guests share their inspiring stories. So it's a pleasure, as always, to have another fellow podcaster on the show today. And I know, listener, that you're going to appreciate this conversation too. Welcome to the Leading with Integrity podcast. Leadership talk for the modern manager. With your host, David Hatch. Eric, welcome to Leading with Integrity. It's great to have you on the show today. Really looking forward to our conversation. David, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure, my friend. Appreciate you inviting me. Well, I appreciate you accepting. Um, As I say, it's great to have you. So we'll dive straight in, I think. Um, A hand over to you, really, to introduce yourself to the listeners. Tell us a bit about yourself, your background, your career so far, and what you get up to today. It was a very broad question. It's very open-ended. Let, let's me start in a lot of different directions, I guess. But the, uh, so the, what I'm doing today is I'm an executive coach uh, and a speaker. And so I work with clients in the area really of, I would call it business slash life coaching, because life coaching can take so many different aspects or, you know, meanings. Um, most of my clients are business executives that are in some state of change or um, transition in their career, trying to make some hard decisions. Often they are feeling somewhat um, like there's an opportunity or there's a crossroads. They often have had a lot of success, but they're feeling like there's something missing and they're trying to decide what that thing is and why they're feeling that way, or they are trying to sort through, do I go down this path of option A and do, or do I go down this path of option B? I'm trying to sort through that. Sometimes they're leveling up in their career and they're feeling like they need a coach to help guide them in that way. So a lot of my, a lot of my clients have been um, somewhere 40 plus years old, uh, a lot of men, but also a fair amount of women that are in the executive suite of a business and or an entrepreneur. And they're trying to sort through this next stage of their career. That guest or that client, I should say, because I also have a podcast and many of my podcast guests have similar stories that they tell. Um, But that client 
is much like I was a few years ago. So I did a 30 year career in corporate America and had a, a kind of consistently elevating levels of success. And yet felt like there was something more. Once I hit 50 years of age, I started to really ask myself, is this what I've been put on the earth to do? Um, yeah, I have a, a deep faith life. And so I, I, I kind of look at this and say, well, if God knows me and he made me, um, he had a plan for me, right? He didn't do this willy nilly. It wasn't an accident or some like, oh yeah, there's this guy named Eric. He had a plan. And so what was that plan? And am I in line with that? Am I using my gifts and talents in the way that I was designed to use them? And, uh, and so I started to work with a coach myself back, you know, again, six, seven years ago, um, and sort through some things and came to this conclusion that I really wanted to have a bit more control of my, of my career, my life. So I stepped out of that corporate role and began coaching individuals and then consulting as well. So I do some consulting work. I came out of a sales and marketing background, business development background. And so I consult with organizations in sales and business development, often working with their leadership team in the areas of coaching and leadership, and then uh, work with individuals on sorting through again, some life choices there. So um, that's been really cool. I also do a podcast. And uh, as I mentioned, called Return to Authenticity, where I interview guests that have made similar sort of pivots toward their authentic self. And, uh, and that's been a fabulous run. Really enjoy that, that creative outlet and the opportunity to meet a lot of great folks like yourself, often uh, on the other side of the microphone. So it's always interesting. I think being a guest and my golden retriever is going to come in to be a guest here in my office as she knocks on the door. Um, and so, yeah, always, always interesting to be a guest and not a host. Um, but, uh, it's fantastic. So I'll, I'll pause right there, but yeah, that, that's a bit about me. So quite a wide and varied set of things that you do then to help people with um i mean from leadership to sales to all, all the all things in between almost it's really trying to leverage my background right so if i think about it's like i had all this i had 30 years of some of the best organizations investing in me with training and teaching and learning and then a lot of client experiences and having done some things from a sales and biz dev perspective that were successful and so i see that as tools i can pass on and i enjoy that that aspect of what i do and then there's the whole headiness around helping people sort through when they're feeling some amount of disconnectedness or lack of satisfaction, or again, they're just trying to sort through, like, well, I'm trying to make some hard decisions here and I need some help doing that. Um, I love that interaction with, with clients. So it's, it's really designing my day has been uh, so fulfilling, right? It's just great to be able to have, for me, having a variety in my day and what my day looks like is, is incredibly fulfilling, really enjoyable to, to work with an organization one day. And then the next day I'm working with, you know, people on sorting through their sort of life choices. So, and is it the variety itself that, that you get really excited about, or do you have a favorite part of what you do? Uh, I do love the variety. I remember it's so funny because back probably, gosh, it's been uh, getting close to 20 years ago. I remember having a a particular role that I had in, in finance back early in my career, I was uh, had a, a finance um, background, and I remember being in this role. I was fairly new to it, and I was in a lo- in, a, in a tall tower and in, in a city city environment. Um, and from all the outward appearances, you would say, "Wow, this is really successful." I had a nice office, with a nice view, and it was up on the tenth floor of a fourteen story building, and you know all these things. And I remember walking down the hall thinking, wow, is this it? Is this like, is this what it's supposed to feel like? Am I supposed to feel better? Cause it, it just felt almost like, is this what I'm going to be doing now for a long time? And so there was a bit of a feeling like there was not the variety maybe that I was looking for. And uh, again, that's 20 years ago and it took a while to get to where I thought, okay, I'm going to create an environment that has a lot of variety. Now there were periods in between that, where there was a lot of variety to the day. That's one thing I really enjoy about sales and business development is that each day can be fairly different and your interactions with lots of people make for a lot of varied conversations. And I, and I definitely enjoy that. Um, so variety is great, but then also the things that I'm doing, um, are excellent too. Right. So I, I love the work and the variety. Fair enough. I'm going to ask you this. So the, since the sort of the COVID yeah. incident, let's say, <laughs> we've we've kind of seen quite a big rise really haven't we of people doing very much what you've done which is walking away from the big corporate career or just the corporate career 
walking yeah. away from being an employee, setting out on their own. I mean, phrases like the lifestyle business, that sort of thing, solopreneur. Do you think that's a, a bit reductive? Do you think that's a, a fair description of it? Or do you think there's a wider trend at play behind that? For me, well, for me personally, for me, are you asking me personally or just more in general? Well, a bit of both, actually. Started before COVID. So mm-hmm. um, I was feeling this for a number of years, kind of leading up to when I actually started to take action and then hired a coach. And those were all in the probably two years prior to COVID. Um, I was feeling, and it was really, again, tied more to my age. I felt like I never really, I, I, I tend to be very fitness minded. And so, you know, I've pushed back father time, I think as much as possible. So I, I run a lot. I, I lift, I do different things to try to keep my body healthy and moving. So I haven't really been troubled by, you know, birthdays, right? People that have, that are always like, oh, I don't want to talk about my birthday or, you know, I, I've never really I felt that I've always been like, eh, no big deal. But when I got close to 50, that number for whatever reason made me think, wow, you know, I'm coming to the, you know, am I going to, how, how long, I, I don't know how long I'm going to live, but it's probably not a hundred, right? I don't know that I'll make a hundred. And so I'm past the halfway point. And so if I'm starting to turn the corner and now I'm past halfway, man, I've got limited time. And it, and it was really I've taken this whole philosophy much, much deeper in the last few years. Um, we can talk about that, but I started to think, man, if I've got less than half of my life to go, what do I want to do in the, in the time that I have left? And so that's what started really the deep questioning of, am I doing what I was put on the earth to do? Am I, am I going to be proud of the legacy I'm leaving behind? What are people going to say about me when I'm gone? You know, sort of that type of reflection. And that caused me to, to to consider for the first time, like, well, if I wasn't doing this, what would I be doing? What do I really enjoy? What do my best days look like? What activities and things am I doing when I feel like, wow, that was just the greatest day when I lay down in bed at night and started to think about how do I create that for myself um, more than just a, the occasion or, you know, a dream. Okay. And I think that leads quite nicely into my next question, which is, why do you think that the successful people are so often unhappy and unfulfilled in those outwardly big, successful, illustrious careers? Yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah, that's a great question, David. Or I appreciate the question. It, to me, it's simply, I'll, I'll give a, you know, a very simple answer, which is they've been climbing a ladder that's been leaning against the wrong building, right? So it's this, it's this idea that we start chasing things that we are either told or we start to believe are the thing that we should chase. And then when we finally catch that thing, we recognize it's not the thing, right? It's, it somehow feels empty. We thought it was going to feel great and yet it doesn't. And I, I take that back and go, well, why is that? And to me, it was that we didn't do a, an, an effective job or we didn't do any job of really asking ourselves what, and what have I been built to chase? Like, what is my divine purpose? And, and so why, why am I here? And if, and if we did that, then I think accomplishing that thing would be extremely fulfilling, right? But often we're chasing things that are more, we're told or taught to chase, right? Often it's money. If you just go get more money, you'll feel better or success at work. So title or responsibility or some level of prestige or it's plastic things, right? Toys and watches and cars and blah, all that stuff, which, Hey, I have no, I'm not opposed to, I love cars. I love cars. I love certain amount of plastic things. Um, but I feel like there, if that is where you're going to gain fulfillment, you, you will ultimately be disappointed because those are things of the world that are really going to fade away and often aren't what they, uh, what they're built up to be. I don't know if you remember when I was a kid growing up, Comic books were fairly popular. I think they still are, but for me, they were popular. And at the back of the comic book, there was always some toy that you could buy and it looked really cool. It was usually some sort of decoder watch or something that was going to tell the future or something. And you thought, I remember as a kid thinking, man, if I had that, it would be so awesome. And, and often I would save my money and then buy the thing. This didn't happen all that often, but it happened certainly a couple of times. You buy the thing and this little chinky, chinsky little piece of garbage toy would come in the mail. And you would think that's the thing. Like that's not a decoder ring. That's not, it was some just garbage piece of plastic. And you were so, I remember just being disappointed. Like, well, I'm going to have to just use my imagination and pretend this thing is what it was built up to be because it's not that. 
And so that disappointment would happen. And I think that's a lot. It's a good analogy for what we do as, as adults, we chase these things that we think are going to be just so fabulous, but there are things of the world that are ultimately going to fade away. And there, there's not a lot of meaning attached to it. So for me, it was really taking a step back and asking some of those questions of what was I designed to do? What was I built to do? Where do I derive great joy? And, and, you know, and, and it involved service, right? It involved serving others and helping people. That is to me where, and now my office mate is looking to leave. Um, and so that is where it, you know, where I can derive great joy and great sense of this is why I'm here, right? It's to help others. And if you, and if you take that a step further, it's literally what we're called to do again, from a Christian faith-based perspective for me, you know, we're called to serve others, love your, love your neighbor as yourself, um, love your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And so when you tie a, your calling to a divine purpose, you will be, I think the satisfaction there is um, immeasurable. I have to say, I really love the analogy about the ladder and the building so much so that might have to be the title for this episode. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Yeah. I appreciate yeah. That. And there's a couple of subjects that are quite relevant to this that I've been talking about a lot lately or, or people have been talking to me about. Um, and there's, I guess two ideas to condense that into one is, when we when we look at managers and leaders in businesses, mm. there's so particularly in the earlier stages of their career, there's so many of them who are chasing it because whether it's just because that's the way it is, that's what it is, the perception, that's what you have to do to progress in your career, or they've gone into leadership because they needed a pay rise or they wanted a pay rise, and that was the only route to achieving that. Mm. And I think so many of them struggle because uh, it's a very similar story. Once they get there, they're like, well, is, oh, is this it? Oh, this is what yeah. I have to do now. Oh, I don't really think I want to do this. I'd rather be doing that that last job I had because I quite enjoyed that, but I needed the yeah. money. And it's that, right. that dilemma, which then leads into the whole debate around does, does money buy happiness, which is totally irrelevant to the subject of what we're talking about, no. but also it's, it's it. not. <laughs> it's not, it's relevant. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So many people make that decision. Um, I've made, I've made that decision. I've made, I clearly remember making that decision. And I think for me at the time, that particular decision wasn't wrong. And I would, you know, to flip that into a positive statement, it, it was the right decision in that moment. So for me, I remember vividly making a decision where my wife and I, we just had our first child and we were in this mode while she was pregnant of, I don't, we don't really know if she's going to stop work uh, outside the home and be a full-time mom or continue to work. And we would do the daycare thing. And so we'll just sort of be loose and try to figure it out as we go and wait for the moment to strike. And so, (laughs) you know, we, we, we didn't make any plans for a daycare or anything like that. We just sort of continued on through this, through her pregnancy. And then when our daughter was born, she had maybe 10, 12 weeks of maternity leave. And so we went through that period. And then as you start to get close to the end of that period, um, it, we started to feel this tension of like, okay, now how, how are we going to, what are we doing here? Like it, either you're going back to work, but we don't have a daycare lined up. So we got to hustle and figure that out. Or you're not going back to work and we got to figure some other things out financially. And uh, I remember, so the maternity period ended, she went back to work. And I, the, the daycare that we sort of had to scramble to find, cause what we learned quickly was, and I never could, I remember the, the, the waiting list in the neighborhood that we were in, in the suburb, in the suburb we lived in, the waiting list for daycare was longer than her pregnancy would have been. Right. So it, it, like, if you got on a waiting list today, they're like, we may have an opening in 11 or 12 months. And I'm like, so people are signing up before they're actually pregnant. It, I didn't, I couldn't get my head around this. And, uh, and, and yet they're like, yep, sorry, it is what it is. So we scrambled and scrambled and scrambled and finally found a daycare that had a shorter waiting list. Um, it wasn't as ideal, but it was actually very close to my work. So that very first day of taking our daughter to daycare, I was tasked with doing that. Right. So I, we put her in the car seat. I drove her to, as you know, toward my work, took her to the daycare, dropped her off and left. And I remember just being, feeling like, oh my gosh, I've just left this, you know, our daughter, this is the most important thing, you know, in, in our, in our lives in this moment. And I've left her with some strangers and I, who I don't know. 
And I remember just being gutted, just absolutely like, I, I don't know if I can get through this day. Right. And probably every parent that takes their child to daycare for the first time has that same feeling. But I remember picking her up after work, being overjoyed, taking her home and saying to my wife, look, you don't have to be brave for if you're putting on this face, like I'm ready to go back to work and, and you're not feeling that. Um, I don't want to tell you what to do, but I'd be fine if you don't want to work outside the home anymore. And she's like, great. I don't want to work outside the home anymore. So I was like, okay, okay. So now we got to figure out the financial part, which meant basically a 50% cut in pay because she was making about the same money I was making. And so she gave her notice and two weeks later, um, she was home and she had a bit of vacation also time that she got compensated for. And so there was a bit of run out on some of that money. But I remember thinking, I got to go find some money here. Like we, we, we can't pay our bills at a 50% pay cut. And so I started to quickly look for what other opportunities existed and ended up taking a job that I knew on the surface was not going to be ideal. It was not a job that I was excited about, but it was significantly more money. And it allowed me to do the thing that I wanted to do and that my wife wanted to do, which was for her to be home, to be with our daughter so that we didn't have to leave her with strangers nine, 10 hours a day. And my wife could be her primary face and person that she was with as we raised her. And, um, and so we did that. And the job was what I thought it was. It was unpleasant. And it took me about two years to move out of that job into something that was far more aligned with what I wanted. And, um, and so, you know, it was a choice I made and it was not what I was put on the earth to do, but it did fulfill a need of providing that money that we needed to be able to afford for her to be home. And so, you know, again, I think we make some of those decisions sometimes right decision, wrong thing, but with eyes wide open and, you know, good intention. So, yeah. Yeah. I think that's it. You've hit the nail on the head there. It's, it's, you know, it can be the wrong decision for the right reason, can't it? Um and I, yeah, I do. I struggle with this conceptually quite a lot because it's so easy for people in our position to say things like, you know, do what makes you happy, forget about the money, and 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 silly, silly statements like that. But the practical yes. reality is, for the majority of people, you, you need the money. <laughs> yes. So most of us, when pin, you know, push comes to shove, we're going to go for what what brings the money in in order to pay for all the other things that we have to do in our lives or that we want to do in our lives. And I think that the same is when you're a business owner, isn't it? And we've all taken a client that wasn't the right fit or we didn't really enjoy working with or we weren't that interested in the project or the work. But because as business owners, sometimes you've got to pay those bills and you have to say yes to something you should say no to, should, in inverted commas. Yes. I, I do think there's a lot to be said, though, for having that sort of practical view of it. And as you say, doing it with your eyes open, not not just doing it because you think it's the way it is and that's what everyone does, but it, uh, understanding and accepting the fact that, yes, it's the wrong thing for me right now, but also it's the right thing because of these reasons. That's absolutely right. There, there was a movie, it would have been probably in the 90s with Mel Gibson, and I believe it was titled The River. I don't know if you saw this movie, but he's a farmer and he's living along this river and this river is sort of the lifeblood of the farming community. If it's, you know, it, but it, as a river will be, it was, you know, sort of unpredictable and tenuous. And so there was often either not enough water or too much water for the farming that he needed to do. And I, there was a one part of this movie where this river, after battling it and struggling and struggling, it, it kind of breaks. It's, it's so much rain. It breaks over the, um, whatever the berm would be called and floods the fields and, and it's just devastation for his farm. And he's already been struggling in his family and all this stuff. And so he takes a job that's away from the farm in a factory. It's like, it's either a slaughterhouse or it's something fairly just, you know, gruesome and terrible and the opposite of the farming, you know, out in nature and, and all this. And with his family, he's in just in a, it's, it's a terrible, terrible environment, but it was necessary for him to make the money that he needed to make to keep his farm from being, taken over by the bank and the family just being destitute. So he takes this horrible job. And so I think those are, that's like a calling for him in this movie. And certainly I think for a lot of men or providers is if my calling is to provide, sometimes I make tough decisions in order to be that provider, in order to provide for my family. But I think 
the the key there is is understanding when to pull back on that and when to lean into it, right? So we can we can lean into that and say I'm going to do this hard thing because it's in the best interest of my family. The trick is, I think we can get caught up then in uh, in telling ourselves that when it's no longer true, right? So I'm going to take this job because it's going to pay me more money because ultimately I'm designed to be the provider and my family will love it when I make more money so that I can, we can take fancy trips or we can do these different things. And often the family will say, but we really just want you. Like we want you present. We want you here. We want you around. And if the job is really taking away, if it there's that law of diminishing returns where they're, you're, you, you're no longer providing into necessity, you're providing into abundance. And and abundance is wonderful. There's nothing wrong with abundance. But if, again, if it's starting to detract from the, your true purpose and calling, that's where I think that disconnect can happen, right? So now all of a sudden, we're taking the job that's taking us away from our family just so that we can have X level of school that's better than what we perceive to be the school that won't be... Um, uh, won't be effective in teaching our child or right? teaching our, our kiddos or a, a next level vacation or whatever it might be that's just no longer serving the your family or your, again, divine purpose, it's taking you away. And so getting caught up in the, in sort of the, the secular and or things that the world will tell you that you need, which is a nicer car and a bigger home and more stuff and more money and more plastic things can be very addictive and can take you down a path, I think, that ultimately leads to is this what it's all about? Right. And, and finding yourself, you can, you step one degree off center. And if you do that for enough years, you find yourself in an entirely different neighborhood, zip code slash st- whatever state. And you're just, you can't even see where you started. Right. So it's like, how do we get back to that uh, alignment with divine and true purpose, right. And true calling. Yeah. I think not, not to hopefully at the risk of getting political, but not to get too political. I don't know that it's a specifically male challenge these days, Mm. although I think there is an interesting societal expectation sort of element to that, isn't there? Um, And at its extreme end, you know, we get into things like toxic masculinity and all Mm. that sort of stuff that we probably don't want to touch on right now. (laughs) (laughs) So I think there there is power, though, isn't there, in being able to do the opposite to the social expectation sometimes because it's the right thing for you, for your family, for even for your, your company, your business. Mm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, certainly. Um, you're absolutely right that women have the same divine calling or have a divine calling, right? They, they have a calling as well and understanding and tapping into what that is, is, you know, critically important. Um, you know, my view is that this idea that, it's interesting because right now I think the, the, the secular notion would be a male that's, that's overtly masculine, whatever that is, define that how you like, is somehow can be seen as toxic, whereas a female that's overtly masculine is somehow celebrated. And, and I don't understand why or where that came from. Um, to me, there's beauty and, you know, as a male, we have masculine traits, we have feminine traits women have masculine and feminine traits. Um, and so, you know, I know, I know women that are expert in jujitsu or fighting and defensive, tr- fantastic, right. Go, go for that stuff. Like, I think that's awesome. Um, you know, men that are sensitive, that can be caregivers and things like that. Fantastic. At the same time, I think, you know, we have divinely built in traits that would say men are men men are going to do certain things and you, you may have proportions that are different within each within a male and proportions within a fe- within a female but this idea that a male that's that exhibits traditional sort of again quote unquote traditional masculine traits is somehow oh that's too masculine i, I don't understand that that concept of too masculine um i think there's unless you're Again, there's negative traits. If if you're brutish, if you're a brute, if you're, you know, those aren't, that's not mm-hmm. divine masculinity. That's, that's being a, you know, a Neanderthal, I think. Um, but, it, but the, 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 the notion of um, stepping up to provide, stepping into a role of leadership, I think is a natural masculine trait. It, it doesn't mean that it's exclusively masculine. Right. And I think males that, that, that demonstrate that are, um, 
shouldn't be told you're too masculine, right. Or pushed into a, a corner on that. I, that that's again, maybe too political, but that's my, right. that's my two cents on that. It's, I don't know where it came from that this, this pushback on, and this whole, the term div, uh, toxic masculinity is to me, it's such a, it's such a hot wire, you know, because mm-hmm. it's, um, it, it can be just, um, I don't know. It, 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 it really can be so, I'm trying to find the right, right word, not exclusionary, but it can be so disheartening for a male to hear like, wait, if I, so if I'm masculine, that's bad. I don't understand. Like, help me understand why being masculine is bad. Unless if you're talking about again, being abusive, well, of course that's bad. That's not divine masculinity, but you know, being a, a leader or a provider, those things I think are uh, natural for a male. Can women be leaders and providers? Absolutely. They demonstrate that every day. Um, is it okay for a woman to be feminine? And uh, yes, they should have a, a proportion of femininity within their being as well. And um, this idea that seems to be so popular is if you're a woman and you kind of reject classical feminine trait, you're somehow celebrated. But if you're a male who who embraces masculine trait, then you're rejected. It's, it's a very odd place that we seem to be in. A lot of this, I think, comes down to the, the, the terminology, doesn't it, and the way it's used, and everyone will understand it slightly differently. Yes. But I think, I mean, certainly in a workplace context, let's limit it to that because that's probably – anything else is well outside my expertise. Uh, yeah. <laughs> even this is touching the edges. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, certainly in my experience, I think the line between to- when masculinity becomes toxic, I think, is when you start trying to impose your understanding of masculinity on other men. Mm. And I think that's where it gets quite difficult, problematic. Uh, um, as for as for women in the workplace, I think you're right. There is a huge expectation, isn't there, to the point that a lot of women, I think, in the workplace, especially female leaders, have to set aside what they may see as their preferred way of interacting or their, their natural traits or their personality even mm. and act in a way that's contrary to their own values but in a way that the workplace and their colleagues expect them to behave mm. in order to get ahead in order to get that position of leadership i think that's quite a well-established problem as well i don't know that they're necessarily applauded for exhibiting those masculine traits as, as you say but yeah. And I, I would just to, to touch on that one last time on, on, I guess mm-hmm. the point I'm trying to make there too, is I think for a woman that's coming up, that's maybe a teenager or, and going into university and trying to decide next, next things there seems to be. And again, this may be just through the pinhole of social media where things get very distorted, but there mm-hmm. seems to be this notion that if you're a female and you want, and your desire is to be a mom and be at home or to raise children that that's somehow seen as small minded and or old fashioned and or unnecessary. And you need to lean forward and go be the CEO and do all these things. And I think if it's not your drive and calling to do that, um, then don't do that. Right. If you want to be a mom and stay home, fantastic. I cannot think of a more celebrated or what should be a more celebrated role than in being a caregiver and a raiser of other humans um, or a co-raiser of other humans than being a mom and more challenging of a job. My goodness, my wife stayed home, you know, walked away from her career. She was seven years into a career when she started to, uh, when, when we had our daughter and started, and she started to be a stay at home mom and the, the work that goes into that job and the, um, you know, again, what, unless, unless her family, me and others are telling her how fabulous she is, she's not getting a lot of recognition. There's no company awards or trophies or new titles to get along the way. You're just doing the work day in and day out. And so it's a, it's a, it's a calling to, to step into that type of thing. And she, and she did. And so for anyone to say, wow, it's just so sad that you gave up your career in order to be a mom, she would say that's ludicrous, right? I've taken on the, the highest calling I can, which is to, to give birth to and then raise a child with my husband. Um, and, um, and so I, I don't feel like I've given up anything. I feel like I've stepped right into my purpose. Right. And so, um, and, and I think women should be told that, that that is, an okay choice to make. You're not choosing like the off ramp. You're not choosing to take the easy road when you make that choice. You're taking sort of the hard road, um, especially I think in today's, again, secular perspective. 
I think, you know, both sides of this, I don't want to say argument, both sides of this debate, let's say, mm. I think take it to an extreme, don't they? I think, you know, you're right. On the one hand, there is quite, and I've seen that myself as well, mm. there is quite a lot of judgment sometimes in a professional mm. setting for people who decide, or even, even, even men taking paternity leave as well, you know, mm. I've seen that raise eyebrows. Yes. Um, and choosing to put, put family first to, to, spend that time with your kids you know it, yes. it, it can be judged by the so-called successful professionals or, you know definitely and then obviously the other end of the scale we've we've talked about that already but <laughs> yes yeah i think when i was coming up with kids there was no yeah. paternity leave and i and i would say that the investment in your family and your children is one that you will never regret it, it is a it is an unbelievable gift and your family ultimately my belief again having raised a couple of kids um is that that time with your children is so short and it is, you will never regret spending time and energy with your kids and with your wife and that investment. And what I often see is people that, again, often men that have neglected that, that the role of being a husband and a father end up at, with, for the sole intent of building a business so that they can quote unquote provide ends up feeling very empty if they've neglected those home relationships and often end in, tragedy or divorce or, and, and so they send that. And then the thing that they're pursuing money and financial success ends up going away anyway, because they've now gotten divorced, you know, or, and, or had other challenges. And so the investment in family and home for a man is, I think, ultimately, again, one that you will never regret. Um, and so, yeah, paternity leave, all those things, if those are looked upon as negatively, negatively or soft is ridiculous. Um, it's a, it would, it's a true blessing to spend time with your family. Again, my my perspective. I, I mean, it's a perfectly valid perspective. Certainly, I think. I, I mean, I'm I'm not a parent, just to put that out there. But even though I'm not, I still try to prioritise family. You know, family's mm. important, and I think ultimately that's why any of us go to work, isn't it? Should but be the most yeah. of us, anyway. But you know, it's for, it's part of it. Yeah, yeah, it's to provide for, it's to enable that family to continue existing, isn't it, ultimately? I I do think, though, when we come back to questions about purpose, whether it's divine or or not, Mm. um, or the secular view, I think that regardless of your belief system, I think everyone is generally happier if they are doing work that they enjoy, that Mm. that fits their purpose, their values in life, whatever the source of those have been. I think, you know, and we've talked already about sometimes the practicality of the situation is you've just got to take the paycheck. And I think that works okay in the short term, as long as, as we've said, you do it with your eyes open, you know what you're doing and why you're doing it. Mm. In the long term, though, I think pursuing that that purpose, whatever it was that your life exists to serve, to do, to achieve, is I think that's that's the ultimate necessity for you to be happy in the long term. Mm. Agreed. So the question is then, a lot of people might struggle with knowing what that purpose is. Mm. How do you find it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I appreciate that question. The For me, it's starting at the very base level, right? What's important to you? Like, what are your core values and understanding what that is, right? What So what are those core values? What do they mean to you and why are they important to you? Um, when you, I talked about a minute ago, um, this idea of understanding what your perfect day looks like. So, um, if you think about it, you know, the end of some days you feel like I'm just exhausted. I've just been beat, feel like I've been beaten to death during my day. And the compare contrast that to the days when you go to bed at night and you may have worked all day or done something extremely long and what could be seen as rigorous, but you feel energized and like, wow, that was excellent what did that day look like? What was included there? If you think about, you know, again, if you, if you kind of roll the clock forward and think, wow, I'm at, now I'm at the end of my career, or maybe at the end of my life and people are reflecting back and saying, you know, Eric or David, this is what they were great at. And man, we so appreciate them for this or that or the other thing. What are they going to be talking about? What are they referring to? And again, this is coming from your own mind. So this is really you telling you what I'm proud of what I did that I felt like was worthy. And so that helps you, I think, understand that, that purpose, that calling, that thing that charges you up, that gives you energy, it gives you excitement. 
And then if you look and say, okay, well, how, how do I make that happen? And it may not be something that you can do tomorrow. It may take some planning in order to be able to fulfill that. You know, if it's, if you feel like, again, you're called to help people physically or heal them or something. So you think, okay, so I've got some calling to, to do, to be in medicine or, um, you know, healthcare. Great. What does it take then to get qualified in order to do that? It may take some schooling or certifications or things like that. It may take, may, may, may take a minute. Um, and, you know, so I, I would say it, it requires a bit of introspection and time to really look at yourself and ask yourself those questions. And I know for, for me, for a long time, it didn't, I didn't do that. Right. I, I more was, I started off in university, like, well, I, I sort of like finance. I like banking. I like the markets. I like understanding business. So I'm going to get a finance degree. And then well, what do I do with that? Well, let's see, I guess I'll go into banking. And, and that was great. I, I met some great people. I learned some neat things, but I didn't really feel like, okay, uh, my purpose was to be a banker and that, you know, that was my thing. And so it really, it just sort of took it. And I felt myself doing that one degree off center move that took me into a place where all of a sudden I thought, man, how did I get here? Like I never could have predicted this, not that it was good or bad. It was just different. And I didn't know, I didn't really fully believe or understand was I doing what I was divinely again for me, divinely created to do. Um, Cause I never took the time to really ask myself those questions. And, and when I did is when sort of that realignment happened. Um, and, and, and again, I think there's, you know, if you think about the hero's journey, right? Familiar with um, the hero's journey concept of storytelling, you know, every great story is told through the, through the eyes of the hero and the hero's journey. So Star Wars fans, Luke Skywalker was on the hero's journey. And um, I think Frodo and Lord of the Rings was on the hero's journey. Um, t- told um, Harry Potter in, in Harry Potter's story and the hero's journey, which is all the, the story basically goes, the hero has a calling that he resists initially and says, no, no, I'm not, up, I'm not equipped for that. I'm not up for that. I don't really want to do that. It sounds scary and terrible. And so that he resists. Um, and, and then he eventually gives into that calling. And so, and then drops out of his comfortable known world into some world of unknown, which is often perceived as the darkness and or the forest and or something that he's sort of bumping around, stubbing his toes in some lost state and has to fight some battles and some dragons and demons along the way and does it with moderate success and or failure, takes some scars, has some impacts, finds a mentor, feels somewhat lost, finds a mentor and a guide who helps them along the way gives them some tools, ultimately has to face the big baddie, the the ultimate big bad guy, uh, wins that battle and returns to the light, returns to the world with some magical elixir and or solution or thing that he brings back to the world that's that's good and that helps and improves the world. We're all in that hero's journey at some point, right? We're, we're all somewhere on our own hero's journey. And so understanding what is that thing I'm supposed to find in the forest? What is that elixir, that magic thing or that uh, service that I can bring back to the world and make the world better is I think what we're called to do again, whether you look at it from a divine perspective or, or just a, my, 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 you know, the, taking advantage of the um, statistical miracle that I am actually on the earth. If you want to look at it as not a divine miracle, but a statistical one, what, what am I, and my short longevity that I have on this earth, what am I really called to do for my humankind around me to help make it better? And, uh, and so trying to understand those things is I think part of that messy, bumpy journey, right? We were, so we're, it's not a straight line. It's not as linear thing. It's this ugly sort of muddy, messy thing that's often taking place in the dark, meaning we don't really know where we're at and we're yet, we're still trying to make decisions and bump along and ultimately find our way back to, you know, this is my gift. This is what I give to the world. I think most of us at some point in our lives are going to be struggling with grappling with that question of like, what, what's it all for? What's the meaning of life? Why am I here? Mm-hmm. And what I love about the way you've just answered that, that question is it, it gives you a way of answering it, doesn't it? Mm, it does. Yes. <laughs> um, we're not all going to be Luke Skywalker, of course. Uh, right. Maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. Um, right. Everyone draw your own conclusions on that, probably. But <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. But it, it's a great analogy because it's Luke, Luke was so messed up and he, when he thought he knew what was going on, he had no idea what was going on when, and then things would be revealed and he would think, Oh my gosh, that's devastating. And yet that thing would actually end up being a good thing. So I think often the trials that we face in life that we think, wow, this is why, like, why is this happening? Ultimately end up being, I never would have imagined that thing leading me to this other great thing. And so that's that crooked and messy path that we're on. So when you're in that muck and you're in those, in those trials, I think part of the challenge and the, the call is just to keep going, keep going and, and look for how can I take this ugliness, this messiness, this whatever thing that I'm dealing with and turn it for good? How can, what's the lesson here that I can take that I can add to my own scar tissue and or then skills that I can bring back and help someone else with, whether you're dealing with an illness or a loss or a, you know, a job loss or a, a family or health or friend loss, you know, how do I take those trials of the world and ultimately turn them for good? Um, and, and it's sort of that opposite of a victim mentality that says this is being done to me and woe is me versus how do I take this um, and use it as something that's been done for me that I can then again use to help others with, right? Um, and it's a, to me, it's an inspiring thing when you think about, wow, the, I love one of my favorite books of all time is The Alchemist um, by Paul, Paul Coelho. And, and it's, if, have you read The Alchemist? I don't know if you have. No, it's a fabulous book. It's a short book. Okay. It's written, written in the form of a fable of, of, the, of a shepherd who is on this journey to find the alchemist, who is a, alchemy is the ability to turn metal into gold. And so, um, or really to work with metals and turn them into different things. But this particular alchemist, he's looking for this out, this person that can help him take lead and turn it into gold. Cause he feels, Oh, if I can do that, boy, I can afford to buy a bigger and bigger flock of sheep. And that will make me a very successful shepherd. And so he's on this journey to find the alchemist. And if you read it from the, from the eyes of the shepherd, don't read it as a viewer above the scene observing it in, but put yourself actually in the shepherd's role as you read it, you recognize the shepherd throughout most all of the story is completely and entirely lost. He thinks he's stuck and yet he's actually being taught in every moment where he thinks I'm locked in, I'm stuck, I'm, I'm, I'm not progressing the way I thought I should or doing the things I think I should be doing. And yet it's actually working out for for perfection. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it's an inspiring story, but it's also one that helps you for me, helps me reflect on, man, when I think I'm lost, I'm actually learning something. When I think I'm stuck or I'm in some sidetrack thing, that's taking me off my, my path. It's actually part of the path. It's just a, it's again, it's a crooked and weaving path that we're on. And so it's a, it's a book. I, yeah, I, I try to read more than uh, once a year, uh, it's not a long book, so it's easy to do and it's very entertaining. It's a, it's a great story. Um, but I, I recommend it to all my clients. I recommend it to all my friends. Like if you haven't read the alchemist, read it. It's a great book. And it's, again, it's, it is the classic hero's journey. Okay. Well, consider it added to my reading list. Uh, I'm sure many a listener will do the same. I, I think the the wider point and particularly in career and professional setting, all of the mistakes we've ever made, all the bad experiences we've ever had in, in the workplace, you know, it's so easy look at those from the negative point of view and just you know especially when they're happening at the time it just you know i've been there i'm sure we've all been there you you just get angry at the situation you get frustrated you take it out on your boss or your colleagues or whoever and i think that what what's missed there is the opportunity to learn something from it it's exactly as you're saying Mm -hmm. most people hopefully if not at the time in hindsight can still look, look back and go okay actually what did that teach me what have I learned from that? How has that experience made me better at what I do today? And sometimes it's just getting through it is what's made you better at what you're doing today or will make right. you better the next time that situation happens. But it is, it's is—it's such a powerful way of reframing the negative, isn't it? And it's yeah. you know, something I recommend everyone does because, I mean, I certainly wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today if I hadn't been able to do that. For sure. Absolutely. And uh, I think it's, it, it's why doing – things that make you uncomfortable or that are hard are why there's value in it because it does teach you that, Oh, when I thought I was, you know, if you take it to a physical uh, type of an example, if you're doing something out in nature and it's physically hard, what did that in those moments where you think I can't go further and yet you do, it demonstrates your ability to maybe accomplish more than you thought you could, which then can be that great lesson for when you're facing other trials, maybe that you didn't plan for or anticipate or want. 
that even though I feel like I'm stuck and I can never get through it, I know I can just take one more step and I will come out the other side. There will be an ending to this, this trial. I remember my mother, God rest her soul. My, my mom passed away in 2018, but she used to always say it's an old fashioned saying that this, this too shall pass. Right. So I remember as a kid, if I was going through some trouble at school or, and I was just feeling down, she would say, don't worry, this too shall pass. And, uh, and I think there's so much truth there that, you know, if you're in a trial, just keep going. You, you, number one, you can definitely accomplish more than you're giving yourself credit for. And you will come through that storm. It, you, you will come out the other side and likely there will be lessons and things you'll picked up along the way that will help you on your next adventure and or trial that you face. Definitely. Uh, another cliche or truism or saying, I'm not sure mm-hmm. which it is, probably all three that I really like is uh, that nothing worthwhile is easy. Uh, yes. I think that. That has helped me a lot of times when I'm struggling with something. I just keep that in my mind. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. That That is uh, absolutely right. I'm going to ask you now about authenticity because it is in mm. the title of your own podcast after all. So it feels like it'd be rude not to bring it up. <laughs> I appreciate that. How do you see the role of authenticity then in our daily lives and in our careers more widely? Because it's quite a, it's quite a buzzword these days, isn't it? A lot of the leadership and management folks talk about it. The marketing people are talking about it as well. But what actual role does it play practically for people every day? I think it, it it's somewhat connected to what we've been talking about so far, which is, you know, the closer we can be in alignment with our authentic self, which is, again, from my perspective, who we were divinely created to be, who we truly are at our core. But even if you said, I, I don't have that belief system, we, we recognize we have gifts and talents and we have things that make us feel like this is me. Um, and if I'm being true to that, I think ultimately it results in, you know, flow state. It results in productivity gains and the ability to do things at a higher level versus I'm, I'm acting out of alignment with my authentic self, I think takes more energy. It, it requires you to, um, to do things that you wouldn't naturally do or otherwise do. And, and so ultimately will result in a less than ideal result or end, end state. I, I sort of equate it to if you were running a race and you had on cement shoes, right? So your shoes were actually made of cement and someone was challenging you to run a hundred yard dash or a hundred, hundred meter run you. And you did that and you got to the end of it and it took you 30 seconds or whatever to run a hundred, hundred meters. And you thought, wow, that, that either was good or bad or whatever, but I'm going to train and I'm going to get stronger and work, work to run faster. And so then you went from 30 seconds to 28 seconds. You thought, wow, look how much better I'm doing. I'm doing so much greater, you know, I'm fabulous. And then continue to work harder and harder and harder and get stronger and stronger so that you could run that same distance in 25 seconds. And you thought, look at that improvement, right? I've improved five seconds off my initial time just through all this grinding and hard work and labor. And the reality is if you took off the cement shoes and you put on modern trainers, you would run the hundred yard, hundred meter dash in 12 seconds, right? or 11 seconds and the world's the world record is like 9.2 or something quite different than 25. And it was that. And, and so the equation there, the metaphor, the analogy is getting, taking those concrete shoes off and putting on modern trainers is the equivalent of aligning with your authentic self and your ability to then do something that you had no idea was possible in, in the analogy going from 25 down to 12, right? Cutting it in half, not incrementally improving, but may, you know, significantly improving your, your ability to find either joy, productivity, uh, you know, happiness with those around you, all those things um, is equatable to aligning with your authentic self. It's who you are, who, what your natural talents are, your natural gifts, what make, what gives you joy and energy where you can keep going because you just feel so fulfilled is who you are is when you are in alignment with your authentic self in my view that's an interesting way of talking about it i'm not not sure i've heard before so if we could turn it to leadership then authenticity Mm. and leadership is it's a big topic this one and i think Mm. it is also quite easily misunderstood i think there's quite a few people out there see it and the same could be said probably for authenticity in the marketing world who Mm. see it in terms of you have to share everything all the time there's no you're not allowed anything private. You've got to just, you know, whatever you had for lunch this week or today or what your breakfast was, put a picture on social media in the marketing context. 
or in leadership, you know, tell everyone what you did this weekend, even if they didn't ask and they probably don't care. That kind of side of it. Whereas actually, I think for me, it's more about, it, it's similar to the way you've described authenticity of self anyway, but I think from a leadership point of view, it's about the work, the team, how your feelings say when something goes wrong, you know, not trying to paper over the cracks as much um, mm. and just being honest and open and being who you actually are. So what are your values? What do you care about? What do you enjoy doing at work? You know, don't hide that. Don't put on the airs and graces. Don't. And again, it goes back to a little bit to what we were talking about earlier in terms of the gender roles at work, doesn't it? And just mm. come to work as you are, but also be a leader at the same time. It's a really terrible way of explaining it, but I hope you know what I mean. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So authentic leadership, uh, you know, I would say, first, what is leadership, right? What, what does that entail? Mm -hmm. And to me, you know, the concept of leadership is servant leadership, right? So the idea that as a leader, leaders should, they should sit last, they should eat last, the team should come first, right? So this idea that as a leader, you're there to guide, support, and help the team. And as opposed to, I think what often happens is the leader thinks, my job, because I've achieved this level of leadership, I get the benefit. So I eat first, I sit first, I enjoy all the things first. I will tell you what I think you want to hear in order to get you to do what I need you to do, which is deception, right? Um, and that that's sort of the opposite of leadership. To me, a, the, the leader, again, is should be there to help the team to do their absolute best by giving them the things that they need and helping them to recognize that they are in it with them and that they will always forego their own pleasure, peace, comfort for the team. That's, I think, how you build a team that is willing to do whatever it takes to succeed when they recognize the leader is, is, is putting them above him or herself. Um, and then if you take that a step further and go, well, how do you do that? How does a leader pass along bad information or, or depressing or sad or negative information to the team without them, without it hurting them, right? How do you not sugarcoat something? So some, something's going on in the corporate world and it's negative. We're having layoffs and cutbacks and uh, reductions. And so um, the leader's got to convey that. The, there's a way to do that that says, to, back to our earlier talk, David, that sometimes the negative thing results in a positive. In fact, not, not just sometimes, I think all the time. You can find a positive thing to take out of a perceived negative. So we're, we judge these things as happening as positive and negative when the reality is it, it all just is, right? We, we don't, often what we see as being a negative ends up being a positive in hindsight. And, and often the reverse can be true something that you think, oh, great, I, I accomplished this thing can take us into a bad place, which ultimately that bad place might lead to something even better, right? So this idea of sort of, oh, that's a good or that's a bad, and I'm going to allow my emotions to kind of take me on this rocky swaying course of happiness and despair based on what I perceive in the moment to be good and or bad, I think is not helpful. I think we recognize and we look at whatever is coming down the pike, we treat it as this is a lesson to be learned. It could be something that we, we, we sort of surfacely perceive as being positive. How do I take this thing and then again, reflect it back for good? If it's surfacely perceived as negative, how do I take this thing and reflect it back for good? Where's the lesson in what I'm doing? And I think as a leader, it's helping your team to see that, you know, we're going to have a reduction. Um, it, th th that kind of, again, on the surface sucks, but we know that the team that's maybe is not going to be in this role is going to find, we're going to help them find where they are going to find this next thing for them. That's going to end up being better than where they are. Um, or, you know, we've had a reduction in budget, so we're not going to be able to do the things that we want to do. Great. How do we take the budget that we've got and make the most of it? How do we get real focused on the things that we need to do with this limited budget that we have less than we hope that we initially hoped it would be, but no problem. Let's take this view of, how do we take it and do the most with it? So it's all seen as a, an opportunity to ultimately do good in the world, do good for the team, do good for each other and lead that, that way. So I don't know if that helps or if that's on point, but 
Yeah, I think it is. Um, big fan of servant leadership as well. I think in order to be a good servant leader, I think you also have to be quite authentic as well, though. So I, I do mm. see them as as very hand 100%. in hand, yeah, rather than opposing concepts. Um, and I guess one of the most powerful examples that I can think of is the leader who, when they know their team is facing redundancies and they know probably who's going to have to go and who isn't, is the one who rings around their industry contacts and organises interviews mm. and says, you know, look, I know this person at that company. I've had a chat with them. They'd be interested in speaking with you. Would you be, would you be open to that? What else can I do to help? Because, you know, redundancy yes. is, I don't want to say redundancy is never anyone's fault because sometimes it's because the business has not been managed very effectively, but right. yes. <laughs> it's, it's usually not the fault of the employee who's facing the consequences, is it? So right. if you as the leader can do something to ease that transition and make sure they land on their feet, as you say, help them learn from the negative and turn it into a positive, then yeah, that's absolutely servant leadership as well, isn't it? So 100%. Yeah. And what you said at the beginning, I think it's absolutely critical that your team trusts you. If your team, if when you speak, your team doesn't trust that what you're saying is truthful because you haven't been truthful in the past, that's devastating. Trust has to be first and foremost, right? That you have to speak truth. And, you know, there's probably times when a leader is directed that this cannot be shared with the team. Uh, you have to share as honestly as you can in terms of, you share truthfully all the way up to the point where you can't share at all. And then you, you have to, I think, honestly, either honestly acknowledge there's parts I can't talk about and, or you share truthfully, but you can't, you can't sugarcoat and, or change the shape and, or tenor of what's being communicated and hope that your team is going to trust what you say, because they ultimately will see through that. And if you've lost trust, you've, you've sort of lost everything um, as a leader. 100%, 100%, yeah. On the rare occasions where people ask me questions like, why does authenticity matter? Um, what's the point of doing it? It sounds like a lot of effort. I don't want to. My answer is usually trust because mm. that's the point of authenticity. It's building trust. To be an effective leader, you have to be trusted, as you say. I think you need to be respected as well. And you, it's rare to get one without the other, in my view. Um one of the most effective ways of building trust, there's loads of ways, leading by example is one, one of my favorites. One of the most effective ways, we go back to what we were talking about earlier with values and purpose and why you do what you do. It's, it's knowing that and being open about what that is for you as a leader. It's mm. then your words. So what you say about that and whether that's consistent with the values and everything that, that you're there to do, there to achieve. So again, it's removing that deception element that you mentioned. And then the third thing is your actions and what you do, what you bring to work every day, how you act, how you deal with people, and whether mm. that's aligned with what you've said about what your values are and then what your values actually are. And if any one of those three things doesn't quite add up, trust will disappear almost instantly. And yes. people will pick up on it. They will detect it. You know, we are human lie detectors, most of us, whether whether you like the cliche phrase or not, right? That's that's a phrase for a reason, isn't it? We we are very good at picking up on when people aren't being quite 100% honest or when they are withholding something or they're just out and out lying. We usually pick it up, especially when there's that leadership dynamic and they're expecting something back from us in return. I think we're pretty good usually at detecting, hang on, something, yeah. something smells off here. I'm not being yeah. told the full truth. For sure. Yeah, hundred percent agree. We are very good. I think at, at picking up on that. One of the things I thought, you know, one one of the ideas I remember thinking of this early in my career was that if my that I wanted people to be able to see me in different roles and see me as the same, like not go, wow, I don't recognize him in that role. So I wanted my kids, if they saw me at work, to not be surprised at how I was acting or behaving. Like, and I've thought about that. Like if my kids were looking over my shoulder right now, would they be disappointed? Would they be surprised? Or would they say, no, that's my dad. That's how, he, that's how he is at home too. It's, it's the way he is, whether, whatever it might be. Now, granted, you know, there's going to be, you know, I might be a goofy, you know, playful person with my kids when they're five years old, that I'm not be doing playful, goofy things at work, but the, the core of who I am and how I'm, interacting with people and the respect that I'm giving people and the way that I'm listening and or interacting with them, the behaviors, the words that are coming out of my mouth, 
I wanted my family to always feel like that's the same person at home that he is at work. And then same thing if I'm at work, but now I'm on a, I'm on a, tr- a business trip. So I'm in another state or another city that, that, that I would be the same person there that I would be at home. There wasn't a reason if I'm in front of a client that I would, that I would be a different person in front of a client that I am in front of my team and and then in front of my family or then in front of the people that I'm with ch- at church with, or, you know, these other aspects or walks of my life that they would all recognize me as being the same that if I was doing that, then I was being at least I had a better chance of being my authentic self. I was either a hundred percent a phony or a hundred percent authentic. And I think, again, there's going to be, you know, small degrees where you're maybe a slightly different in how you present something or speak. But I think really that's a somewhat of a cop out. I think we should be able to be, and sh- and the goal should be that we are the same regardless of our current walk of life or can- or current um, place that we are in our day to day. And and if we are, then we are, I think again, a higher likelihood that we're being authentic or true to our authentic self. Again, either that or a hundred percent you're in, you're inauthentic, right? Um, that you're consistently and I, you know, I think human nature is we battle that we battle this idea that, well, oh, the world wants me to show up this way. So I'm going to kind of force this or pretend this way that I'm super confident or whatever it might be when I'm maybe not. And I, I think ultimately that creates this dissonance in our psyche and our internal that makes us feel like, man, um, that wasn't real. That wasn't true. I had to really put out a ton of energy to put that out there because it just isn't who I am. And I think ultimately that doesn't serve us. I think ultimately it's, it's more people, if we feel like we're doing that typically because we feel like we won't be respected otherwise, that people won't, will think less of us if we aren't that way. And I think ultimately that's not true. I think people more appreciate that's the honest, authentic guy. That's the person. And, and I appreciate that he's that way. Right. I don't think less of him. Yeah, I, I think you're right, definitely. I think that's actually a really healthy way of looking at it. Um, and I think the other reason I'd, I'd add to your list there, actually, is if you are putting up, putting up that facade at work in particular, it will slip at some point. Mm. You know, sooner or later, when especially when you're under stress, when things are maybe challenging and people are looking to you more in those times, so it's even more important then. If the facade slips because it does take a lot of energy and you need that energy for dealing with the stressful situation, people will remember that. They're going to notice it. And it's like, oh, hang on. Why is he? That's totally Mm. out of character. That doesn't make sense Mm. at all. And it's jarring and it just adds another thing to the pile of problem that you're dealing with at the time. Yes. And then, of course, there's the other one, which was uh, never tell the same lie twice, that whole thing. And (laughs) if you tell the truth, it's easier to remember. Oh, easy, man. Um, (laughs) So easy. Yeah. Yeah. My brain is not to the point where I can remember a bunch of lies. It's just uh, there's no way I would have success with it. So the truth is the only way. Right. Absolutely. Or just always tell the same lie. Then you've only got one to remember. But that's that's probably not the right way to look at it, is it? Mm -hmm. Agreed. (laughs) Uh, right, so I'm slightly conscious of time, so I'm going to skip over a few questions. I've only got two more I'm going to ask you because these are some of my favourite questions and I know they're difficult mm. and then it's just the way I am, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, so first one of those, if you could go back in time and start your career over again, mm. is there anything that you would do differently? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so over your shoulder is a picture of some aviation, some airplanes, right? And as a kid... Uh, but probably like a lot of kids, I was enamored with flight and airplanes and specifically military planes. And so I had built all these models, model airplanes, and I just knew I was going to be a military, what I thought was be, I'll be a fighter pilot, right? And there's certainly all sorts of pilots in the military, but I was like, again, probably like a lot of young kids, um, I'm going to be a fighter pilot. Yeah, there you go. And so I went down, you know, I, I sort of head to, headed down that path and, you know, teenage years, I had every book on aviation you could, you could have. And that's an exaggeration, but I had a lot. And so, and I would pour through all the specifics of the planes. I mean, I knew all the data and any kind of movie that was relative to flying. I was all watching a dozen times. So I just knew like that was going to be my thing. And then as I got to where it was getting closer to time for selecting to go to the military, I remember starting to talk with my dad about, about that. And he was not in the military. We didn't have a lot of people in our family that were in the military. I had an uncle that was in the Marine Corps and, um, 
Um, but I didn't have any real role models or mentors, but my, I have a very close relationship with my father and, and I've always thought, you know, taking his words very much to heart when he would make recommendations. And so I said to him, I'm, you know, I want to be a pilot, fighter pilot in the military and join the military, but join the air force. And, uh, he was like, yeah, I don't know if that's a great idea because number one, it's really hard to get that. Otherwise everybody would do it. Right. So it's really hard to get that fighter pilot thing or even any kind of pilot thing. And you got to be really, really good at math. And while you're pretty good at math, you may not be good enough at math. And, um, and then if you don't make it, you're likely going to be on kitchen patrol was what his kind of analogy was, right? You're going to be peeling potatoes in a kitchen somewhere, or you'll be an MP military police. So you'll be some guard. And, uh, and I was like, wow, is that really right? And he's like, if you don't get the pilot thing, they're just going to put you where they need you. And they always need people in the kitchen. They always need guards. So that's probably where it's going to end up. And I was like, man, that sounds terrible. And I'm, and I just sort of gave up the dream, right? I, and that's on me, right? So I, as a kid, so to go back to your question, what would you do maybe differently, I think is what it was. It would have been, I would go tell myself, if you've got a dream, stick to it, like see it out, fight for it. If you really felt that call, if you want to go fail at it, great. I mean, you might fail, you might, but it might take you somewhere else that you can't envision right now. So go try it. And maybe you end up being something else in the military. If you didn't make the pilot thing, maybe it doesn't end up being kitchen patrol. Maybe it doesn't end up being, you know, military police. Maybe it's something else that's equally or even better than you could have imagined. So pursue that dream. And then the second dream would have been, so when I sort of, you know, again, started to write that off, the other thing that I was really passionate about as a kid from the age of probably 10 years old on was cars. And so I had every car magazine and car book and foreign cars, European cars and sports cars and all the car stuff. And I just, and I loved to write as a kid, which not a lot of kids do, but I would, I had notebooks full of stories I would write. So I was a creative writer. I loved to write fiction stories. And then often they involve cars. And so I was, my dream was I'm going to be a writer and I'll be a, not only just a writer, but I'm going to write a specific dream for, I'm going to write for a car magazine where I get to travel the world, drive the finest cars, don't have to own them, but I can drive them and enjoy them and travel and see the world and write about them. What could be better? And I remember as I was now getting really close to college, university here, um, was my choice was going to be going in to get a, well, I thought, what do you do? How do you do that job? Well, I probably need a journalism degree. So I'll get a journalism degree. I remember talking to my dad about that. And he, he was like, that's, I don't know if that's a great idea because if you think about it, there's only a handful of car magazines and there's only a handful of writers on each one. So there's probably not a lot of those jobs to go around. And, um, and so, um, it's likely going to be that you'll get this journalism degree and you'll have to go to work for some newspaper in some small town. And um, you're probably not going to like that because your personality isn't to be like some pushy journalist that's asking hard questions. And so, you know, I don't know that that's a great idea and you're probably not going to make any money doing that. And so it, I wouldn't do it. And I was like, oh, okay, that sounds terrible. And so what should I do? And he was like, business is a good thing. Why don't you go into business? Like get a business degree. So I was like, okay, I, you know, again, I'm sort of shortcutting the story, but it was like, okay, I'm going to get a business degree. And so off I went down the business path. So again, to me, the lesson there was I gave up on a dream really easily, really quickly. And, um, and I did it because of some advice I took from someone that I love and respect, but that advice might not have been correct, right? It was advice that he was giving from the lens he had, which my dad grew up in sort of abject poverty, right? Very poor family, wondering where the next meal was going to come from. So he had a massive safety need, right? This need for the, the idea that I have a predictable paycheck that's safe and I understand was all was what he pursued in life because he did not have that growing up. Well, I didn't have that lens, but he did. And I took that on me because I trusted my dad, right? I trusted that he loved me and he, and he does. And he was giving me the best advice he could, but it was coming from a place of where he came from, not from where I came from. And so I think you have to trust, if to consider when you're asking people for advice or guidance, man, you got to consider where it's coming from. If they're going to give you advice, um, really consider where it's coming from. And if it's a good fit, even if you love that person and you think they have their best interest at heart for you, what they're giving you might be the thing that that is the lens they're seeing things from, which may not be where you are seeing things from. So if you truly just take that advice wholeheartedly, 
it may lead you directly off course. Right. So consider that that that's advice I would give to my younger self. Right. And so I think I would have met a heck of an airline pilot. Um, uh, because I have the right, I have the right personality for it, the right tendency for it. I, and I remember talking, it's funny because I, middle of my college career, I talked with an, a commercial airline pilot who was a friend of a friend of ours. And I told him I had this interest in flying. He's like, oh, you should pursue that. And, uh, and I was like, yeah, but it's, I think it's really expensive and it's going to take me a you know really long time to build up enough hours. And then I don't even understand what this road looks like. And he was like, are you an athlete? And I, yeah, I'm an athlete. What do you, what's your sport? And at the time it was, I played a lot of baseball and I also was playing a, at that point a, a lot of tennis. Oh, you've got great eye-hand coordination. It's really important for a pilot to be able to have great eye-hand coordination. You can think, you're, you're fit. You'll be a great pilot. You should pursue that. Again, a completely different view of air fly, of piloting than the one that I got from my dad, who my father loves me and devoted his life to his children, and his family. He had great intention, but he gave me a completely different set of advice. Had I had the advice from this other individual as a 16 year old, it might've led me down a different path. The point there is I was choosing to believe what I was hearing, maybe not because it was correct or right for me, but because I just thought this person has good intention. They love me. They're going to give me great advice. Maybe not even though they love you and they have great intention, it may not be the right advice. So consider it. And if you have a dream man, pursue it, pursue it, see where it takes you, right? That, that would be advice I would give. I mean, the other way to look at it is if it was a dream you really were passionate and cared about, you maybe wouldn't have given it up that easily. So sure. maybe you still ended up in the right place. Who knows? Who knows? 100%. This, 100%. this is why I love these hypotheticals because it makes you ask yeah. those difficult questions. hundred percent. I believe I am in the place that I was designed to be. Right. So I think about that too. And I I thought about, you know, had I gone in the military, maybe I would have, you know, not met my wife. I met my wife at a young age. I was 19. um, And I might've been in some far off land and maybe never would have met her, which means I don't have my children that I have. And and it's an entirely different life. And so I I really believe I am where I was designed to be. Um, Again, back to that hero's journey. We don't know those places that we kind of bump along to in the dark. Um, but ultimately we are where we are and it's, it's just about kind of figuring out what do I take from the lessons I've learned and continue to seek what am I designed to take back to the world? Absolutely. Leadership heroes. Well, I only have one question left. This one is my absolute favorite though. So okay. you've left to save the best for last. Absolutely. Yeah. And you might struggle with it. We'll see. Some people do and others just have an instant answer straight away and don't even have to think about it. So we'll find out. I'm intrigued. It's called Let Leadership it. Heroes. And the question is, if you had to pick one person and it could be anyone you like, alive, dead, past, present, mm. real, or even fictitious, who in your opinion would perfectly embody leadership, who would that person be and why? Yeah, that for me, it's a that's a straightaway easy question. Um, you might know where I'm going with this one. So to me, Jesus Christ was the ultimate leader. He he was a servant leader. He led. He he fulfilled all the things that we've talked about in our discussion about leadership, which was he considered others first. He served. He sacrificed himself for the greater good for the for the greater for the good of humanity. He you know he washed the feet. He tended to the lepers. He took care of the the meekest of the meek those that were outcast and, and not considered, he ate with them, sat with them. Um, he recognized his role was to serve, right? People had this view of what a king would be, and they thought it would be the person that sat on the throne and dominated from above. And he was this, um, you know, this, the servant leader. He was the, the leader who came in the form of a slave, right? And so um, to me, that is the ultimate example of servant leadership. Do you know, usually I, I'm caught by surprise and I can never predict what the answer to that question is going to be, but I was pretty confident I knew who you were going to choose <laughs> based yeah. on the conversation we've had, especially the emphasis on servant leadership as well. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, I mean, he's, he's chosen quite regularly, actually. And I think that speaks to yes. how widespread the, not just the religious aspect, but the example mm. that he said mm. was. And, you know, whether you believe or you don't believe, I think there's still value and impact to be had from the lessons we can learn from, even if you just see it as a story, which right. a lot of people do. Yeah, also, sure. well, Eric, it's it's been a, a great conversation with you today. Thank you again so much for your time and all your insight as well. 
one last thing I will ask you is if any listener has enjoyed the episode, I'm sure many of them have, they'd like to learn more about you, perhaps listen to your podcast or reach out about working with you as a coach, where can they go to find out more? Yeah, thanks for that question. The best place is my website. There'd be three places I would direct you. My website is ericsardina.com. So just my first and last name, ericsardina.com. And uh, my podcast is Return to Authenticity. It can be found on all platforms in audio version only, although the role, the goal right now is to get it on the YouTube here this year. Um, but right now it's on Spotify and Apple and all the other places that you find podcasts. And, um, and the third would be Instagram and LinkedIn. LinkedIn is just my name, Eric Sardina. And Instagram is Eric underscore Sardina 26.2. So 26.2 um, yeah, is my handle, Eric underscore Sardina 26.2. I have to think about that because I'm, 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 I'm socially, uh, I'm not, I'm not a good social media, but that's the one I've chosen to kind of focus on. And so, uh, yeah, you can find stuff out there, um, about me on, on Instagram. Lovely. And I'll pop links to all of that in the episode description. So everyone can find it easily. Well, that's it. That's all we've got time for. Thank you again so much, Eric. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, David. Appreciate you so much. Likewise. Thank you, Eric, for your positivity, your lessons and your stories today. Listener, if you would like to learn more about Eric, then as always, please do click on those links in the show notes to visit his website or find him on socials. Thanks so much for listening today. I hope we've inspired you to find your purpose and lead authentically. Join me again next week when I'll be talking with Olympic medalist, TEDx speaker and coach Joey Lai about confidence high performance and how to adapt and thrive speak to you again soon and in the meantime be a leader not a boss